From New York City for our viewers worldwide, I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow. A bit of a softer tone after yesterday's rebound led by the NASDAQ. The countdown to the open and to Sintra starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up, Fed Chair Jay Powell joining his global counterparts for a panel in Portugal. The U.S. is said to be weighing new curbs on AI chip exports to China, weighing on futures with losses concentrated on the semiconductor stocks. We begin, though, with the big issue, all eyes on Central Portugal. The big show is going to be on Wednesday. Central banks have uh, seemingly become more hawkish. More and more hawkish. It is starting to bite. I'm looking at Centra. I don't know if we'll hear a whole lot new from, from Powell. We've got an opportunity for key central bankers to explain themselves. Core inflation uh, remains quite high. Inflation continues. The central bankers are still focused on the inflation picture. Central banks feel compelled to attack that aggressively. I think it's a, a relatively hawkish message still. There could be a lot more momentum left uh, in, in the hawkish cycle. Central banks around the world have to continue to tighten. They need to keep policy tight. There's a lot of stuff on the table. So just how much should we be caring about what we're going to hear in about a half an hour time? Joining us now to discuss is Morgan Stanley's Lisa Shallot and J.P. Morgan's Jack Manley. Lisa, how focused are on you? What are you on what they have to say today in about a half hour time? Look, clearly it's relevant that we're going to continue to hear uh, the litany of central bank, uh, um, you know, uh, rhetoric really around uh, being tight around the fact that the economy is not falling apart, uh, that labor markets remain tight, uh, and that the inflation readings are nowhere near their targets. And so um, I don't expect a lot new, but I do expect a reiteration uh, and a passionate reiteration um, of the view that, you know, higher for longer is uh, the mantra. Jack, do markets have any repricing to do with an aggressive and enthusiastic reiteration of a hawkish message? I think they probably do, Lisa. I mean, we have seen time and time again that central bankers uh, have been very straightforward about what they think is necessary in terms of policy, and they have been thus far true to their word. For whatever reason, though, I think the markets are still having a hard time accepting that reality. And so I think there is a little bit of short-term downside risk, particularly on equity prices, uh, as that reality just gets reconfirmed uh, perhaps today. Jack, we were just talking on surveillance with a number of different investors who are actually revising upwards some of the projections for the second half of this year, getting more aggressive in equities, seeing more optimism in the balance sheets and the reports that we've seen so far. It sounds like you would push against that. Why? I think in the short term, if we're thinking high-level index-based investing, we are dealing with uh, multiples that are a little bit stretched, uh, and we're dealing with earnings expectations that are probably a little bit lofty. You know, our bottoms-up estimate right now is looking for about 10 percent earnings growth this year. I think that probably needs to get cut in half before it starts to look a little bit more realistic. You add on top of that the fact that for the first time in a very long time, the bond market actually looks inexpensive relative to the equity market. I think a short-term kind of tactical overweight into fixed income uh, makes sense at the moment. Uh, Lisa, we've been hearing this from a lot of people. And do you also push back from this optimism that you're hearing increasingly from people revising upward some of their expectations for risk in light maybe of the pricing that we've gotten so far this year, but also some of the fundamental data coming in better than expected? Yeah, look, I do think that that everyone does need to acknowledge that the fundamental data has come in stronger, uh, that we and we, it does appear that we have some fundamental resilience here, whether it's in, in you know the housing, residential housing side of the market, the durable goods orders, uh, you know, very very decent. The labor market's still very strong, and we know two thirds of GDP growth is consumption, and as long as people have jobs, they're probably going to continue to spend. So the reality is, if you look at Atlanta GDP now, as of this morning, you're looking at a forecast in the second quarter for real growth of 1.7 percent. You add that to 5.3 percent inflation, and you're looking at nominal top line growth in this economy that's still running hot. It's still running at about 7 percent, and we have a Fed funds rate uh, that is at 5 
And so, uh, you know, this is a scenario where, yes, certainly uh, might uh, corporate earnings be a little bit better uh, than than perhaps, um, you know, folks like us who've been on the more cautious side uh, have forecast. Yes, certainly that is is a possibility in, in the second and third quarter if this momentum continues. But I think the implication uh, is that then you have to think about multiples. As we move you know, earnings estimates up, do you really want to continue to put a 20 times forward multiple on those earnings, which increasingly are unsustainable uh, you know, if, in fact, the central banks around the world are going to succeed at getting to anywhere close to 2 percent? Well, given that, Lisa, are you getting more cautious or less cautious heading into the second half of this year? So we're very cautious, and I don't know that I want to say we're inc incrementally more cautious, uh, but I do think that the, f the further this market runs, the wider those uh, price earnings multiples go, uh, you know, the, the further they're going to have to fall to get back down uh, to earth to a more realistic view that might suggest uh, that the neutral rate here for the U.S. economy is nowhere near you know, sub 1% uh, or, or even sub 2%. The neutral rate might, in fact, be closer to 3 or 4 uh, And that really changes asset valuations. Jack, do you agree? Are you on the same page? I, I am on the same page. I think that we are looking at a new interest rate regime moving forward. And when you think about what the Fed is doing, clearly 5.5% uh, is not the terminal Fed funds rate. But at the same time, very clearly 0% is not a place that we're going back to anytime soon. Even if a recession were to materialize, we don't think it's going to be significant. Even if inflation does uh, continue to cool, we don't think it's getting down to where it was pre-COVID uh, uh, for, for quite some time. And so in this world where the cost cost of capital is no longer zero. You have to be very thoughtful about how you are allocating your money. That's going to bring valuations down across the board. And I think it also means that when you are pursuing particularly growthy names, more tech-oriented, tech-focused names, it is a growth at a reasonable price story, not a growth at any price story. That suggests a bias toward quality sort of wherever you're looking in the equity market right now. Jack, have you gotten more cautious heading into year-end? And I ask this at a time when a lot of people are revising upward their expectations of certain tech-driven sectors in particular. Are you in the same camp that Lisa is not getting necessarily more cautious, but really sticking to your guns? I'm sort of sticking to my guns right now. You know, I am starting to see some pockets of opportunity that are looking more interesting. A lot of that has to do with just the extraordinary valuation dispersion that we're seeing within the market. You know, high level S&P 500 forward price to earnings ratio is extraordinarily elevated. But if you open up the hood on that one, those elevated valuations are being driven by a handful of names. Other parts of the market are still looking more attractive, particularly on the value side of things. So short term, I'm a little bit cautious. I don't think I've gotten more cautious necessarily, but I think there is some uh, room for risk for, for irrational exuberance here. Uh, but I'm also not throwing in the towel and, and running for the, uh, the hills right now. Um, one, I am still a long-term investor. One big uh, wild card has been the banking sector, whether we really are out of the woods. The Fed releasing its stress test results today at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, marking the start of three regulatory actions that will impact how much capital banks will be required to hold on their balance sheets. Joining us now is Bloomberg Schneider. Shanali Basak. Shanali, what are we looking for today? We're looking for banks to with, undergo here a scenario in which unemployment peaks at 10 percent, commercial real estate plunge is 40 percent, and the dollar surges against most major currencies. But listen, Lisa, there are some scenarios here that are stricter than last year. For example, home prices are going to fall more than last year's tests. You're also going to see peak GDP declines that are almost double what you saw last year. So will banks undergo this stress test as easily, and what does that mean for their capital return plans. Now, remember, the Fed asked banks really to wait a couple days. Investors expect communications to really come back from the banks late Friday, Friday potentially after market closes here. But it could take some time here because there's also the Basel III endgame that banks are waiting for as well. The expectation here is that there could be some constraints when it comes to capital return. We saw it even last year. Citigroup and J.P. Morgan even facing higher stress capital buffers that had tended to limit their capital return to some degree as well. Well, but the question here is not only for the biggest of the big banks, which are also facing exploratory market shocks that will 
face. They're trading desks that don't have immediate implications for their capital return plans. And therefore, you look then at the regional and mid-sized banks here that have already guided investors to caution on what they can expect from capital return given the tougher rules ahead. Shnali, thank you so much. Still with us, Lisa Shallot and Jack Manley. Lisa, how much are you looking to the potential for the banking sector to still face some stresses versus it's all clear, which seems to be the feeling right now in markets? Yeah, you know, we have not uh, bought into the all clear scenario. Uh, you know, our sense is that these are the kinds of things that are, you know, slow melting icebergs and that uh, the current situation, the stress and absorbing uh, the rapid rise in interest rates, the way uh, uh, regional banks had financed themselves, had, had chosen in many cases not to fully mark uh, their treasury books, the fact that they face uh, potential exposure to the commercial real estate market in, in a big way, uh, and there's pricing vulnerability there. Uh, our best guess is this is far from over. Uh, I don't know that I want to go out on a limb and say we're going to witness, you know, four more uh, bankruptcies of the size that we've already seen. Uh, but I do think we are going to face um, a period of uh, banking system consolidation uh, over the next two years. And I do think that, that there's still more pain uh, across the sector. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some great opportunities to invest in who we think the winners are going to be. And I do think that some of the largest banks and some of the super regionals um, are going to be the winners, are going to be the survivors. Uh, and given the way they're priced today, uh, probably represent good long-term value for patient investors. Jack, how are you factoring in potential stress, albeit maybe not another catastrophic blow-up, uh, in the banking sector at a time when people are talking about the boiling of the frog, the sort of tightening in credit conditions around the economy? I think it is just another net drag on this economy that we will have to sort of trudge through over the next 12 months. You know, we are already dealing uh, with a widened out trade deficit. We're already dealing with the fiscal drag. We're already dealing with a housing market that's come under pressure relative to where it was uh, a couple of years ago on the back of higher mortgage rates. With banks uh, sort of losing confidence and tightening the belts a little bit, being less willing to lend, that is yet another strike against this economy and yet another thing that the labor market has to sort of buoy out. So uh, on the margin, I don't think it's going to have uh, a whole lot of, of an impact on the bigger picture story, uh, but it is one of the many things that we're looking at when it comes to the health of this economy. Lisa Shallot, Jack Manley, both of you are sticking with us as we head toward that Centra conference at 9.30 or 9.35 a.m. Eastern. Joining us now with a look at the stocks moving ahead of the opening bell, here's Abigail Doolittle. Lisa, we do, of course, have some weakness overall for stocks after yesterday's rally, and a big driver for it is AI and chips. We have a pullback here on a report that the U.S. may seek more curbs in terms of selling AI-related chips to China. This has NVIDIA down 3.3%, 3.4%. Advanced micro devices also down 2.7%. Now, those have obviously are chip companies uh, and that AI-related uh, business. Tesla, some consider to be an AI-related company, but to the best of my ability to determine, no chips involved. So right now, it's hanging on to a small gain up three-tenths of 1%. Let's see whether or not the AI mood, which today is risk off takes Tesla down as the day opens up Lisa Abby thank you so much coming up US China tensions simmering over that potential for new AI chip curbs intellectual property theft or spying or trying to sort of steal US technology this has been a sort of a mainstay for quite some time in US policy it's quite consistent and it, you know the Chinese have not been as responsive uh, to US complaints about this that conversation coming up next this is Bloomberg Intellectual property theft or spying or trying to sort of steal U.S. technology. This has been a sort of a mainstay for quite some time in U.S. policy. It's quite consistent. And, it, you know, the Chinese have not been as responsive uh, to U.S. complaints about this. They just want more response. So, like, you can't keep stealing things from us. We're going to crack down on your companies. We're going to launch charges. And we're going to basically ban exports of highly sophisticated technology until we can get a handle on how much you are literally stealing from us. U.S. chip stocks under 
pressure following a report from the Wall Street Journal saying that the U.S. may tighten curves on exporting AI semiconductors to China, a move that would weigh on this nation's sales, with NVIDIA getting roughly a fifth of its revenue from China. Let's get to our team coverage. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hardern in Washington and Katie Greifeld here in New York. Anne-Marie, I want to start with you. What's the latest that we understand with the timeline and what exactly the U.S. administration may propose? Well, this is reporting about uh, from the Wall Street Journal about this expansion on these export controls. Remember, in October, we've had these export controls on certain sectors of the Chinese economy. And now they would be looking into the chips that are needed uh, for AI computing. So obviously, that's why you see the likes of NVIDIA down today. Um, it also comes at a time, Lisa, where Jenny Leonard and myself have also reported that the U.S. administration is really starting to ramp up on the outbound investment executive order. And this would go towards things like semiconductors, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, any U.S. money that potentially is going to China could be stopped or regulated. All of this potentially could be taking place this summer. And we should note it comes at the same time that we're reporting Secretary of the Treasury Janet Yellen will be making her trip in early July to Beijing. It's going to be an interesting tightrope for her to walk. Yeah, the push-pull of either friends or not. Katie Greifeld, from the market perspective, we are seeing uh, the shares of some of these chip makers sell off today. What is the sense on the street about how significantly this could impact revenues and profits in the drivers of this year's rally? Well, if you look across sell-side research so far this morning, there doesn't seem to be an over sense of concern. If you take a look at Morgan Stanley, for example, they don't view these potential restrictions as a major disruption to NVIDIA in particular, and City 2 writing that NVIDIA should be able to move its chips around given that AI demand will likely exceed supply. And that might explain why NVIDIA right now, it's off 3.5%, which isn't nothing, but just for some context, uh, that would only be its biggest drop since about Monday. And you're seeing, of course, declines across the broader sector as well. Well, but NVIDIA, it's up 185% year to date, so maybe a 3% drop. Shouldn't be too unusual. Obviously, though, that has implications for the broader indexes, given that this is, I think, the sixth uh, largest company in the world at this point. Thank you so much, uh, Anne-Marie Hodern and Katie Greifeld. Their rally so far this year has brought this to a $1 trillion stock. Lisa Shallot and Jack Manley both back with us. Jack, how much are you leaning into the AI trade versus stepping back after how much of a run-up we've gotten and given some of the geopolitical concerns. Yeah, Lisa, when I think about AI, I, I think it's the real deal. I think it has the power to be to totally transformational uh, in terms of the way that, that we, we live our lives and we run our businesses. But I don't think it's going to do all this tomorrow, and I don't think it's going to do all this next week. This is a long-term story, and we have to realize that we are still in the infancy of this stuff. And I would expect because of that, there's, that there's going to be an enormous amount of creative destruction. You know, the winners that are ha the winners right now may not be the winners in the next 10 to 15 years. So you have to be very careful about where you're allocating. Uh, and I think that there is a possibility that some of these names are probably uh, a little bit overbid at the moment, just based off of this hype and this fear of missing out that I think a lot of investors may have. Can you give us a sense of who you're talking about, Jack? Uh, not specifically, uh, no, no companies that I can mention here, but I just think it is an, uh, an excellent example of, uh, of where active management, manager selection, security selection is going to be extremely important. Buying into a, a chips index, buying into an AI index uh, may not necessarily be the right play if you are looking out over the next five to ten years. Lisa, how much has your call been influenced by the advent or at least the uh, increased adoption of artificial intelligence so far this year? Are you leaning into it in the same kind of way? I, I really um, agree with virtually everything that Jack said. You know, I think, you know, our perspective is AI is the real thing. Uh, but like so many transformational, particularly te enterprise technologies, um, it's this is going to be a long story. It's a story about process change. It's a story about capital substituting for labor. Uh, and it's a story, um, quite frankly, where it's not going to ultimately be about the tech makers. It's going to be about the tech takers. And in that way, this is not like the smartphone. Uh, it's a lot more like the Internet. And the same way that the Internet ultimately wasn't about JDS Uniphase and Corning Glassworks and AT&T, it was about Amazon. 
right? Uh, I don't know that generative AI ultimately is going to be about NVIDIA. And, you know, as much as, uh, you know, I think NVIDIA is in a unique position and has generated a huge amount of wealth for folks, um, it, it may not be the ultimate winner to Jack's point. It may be the tech takers. It may be the companies that implement generative AI to truly disrupt and transform and creatively destroy and reinvent their business models. Given that the rally year to date has been so concentrated, Lisa, on a number of names, including NVIDIA, including a lot of the AI complex, how do you come up with some sort of overarching call without having some sort of AI thesis underpinning it? Well, look, I, I think our call is, is really about, you know, owning some of the things away from the market cap weighted index, exactly to Jack's point. This is about active management. It's about stock picking. It's looking for value in the market. And where a lot of that value is, is in companies. Uh, and I would suggest in the healthcare sector, in the financial services sector, in the real estate sector, uh, you know, in the utilities sector, in the energy sector that are going to be transformed uh, because they're going to adopt uh, these technologies. And so play it that way, um, you know, play it below the surface. Uh, and you're, you know, buying companies that may be selling at 14, 15, 16, 17 times forward earnings, not 28. Jack, just quickly here, how much are you looking at some of the big tech as not necessarily driving forward, but perhaps being more neutral as a weighting or something that you might want to be looking at? I mean, I would say, right, that the handful of big tech names have driven the rally thus far this year. And because of that, it's easy to forget that there are another 490 plus stocks in this index that haven't done quite as well. That valuation dispersion, the performance dispersion, uh, I think means that you have to start looking outside of those mega cap technology names uh, for some of that performance that we may be looking for over the next six to 12 months. Jack Manley, Lisa Shalit, both of you, thank you so much for being with us. Coming up, the morning calls and later, Fed Chair Jay Powell joining the other side global central banking heads in Sintra, Portugal. We'll take you live to the ECB forum in Sintra. That's still ahead at the opening bell. This is Countdown to the Open. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrell. Moments away from the start of trading, about 20 seconds to go, and you can see that downward draft driven by the NASDAQ after yesterday's rally, down about uh, half a percent. You can see the S&P futures down three-tenths of a percent, yields lower as well as we take a look at a potential softening in trend. And as we look forward to what we're expecting to see out of Sintra, Portugal, with all the central bankers, 10-year yields lower by three basis points, 3.73 percent. Crude, marginally higher, regating losses from earlier this morning, but still sub-70 on WTI, $67.96, and a little bit of dollar strength, although uh, and not really moving out of this range. 109.34 with the euro-dollar cross. We are seeing some significant UN weakness after China's moves to try to step in and bolster those markets. Let's take a look at some of the stocks moving at the start of the day. Abigail Doolittle here with more. Well, we are looking at a little bit of weakness for the futures or actually for the indexes, as you're talking about, Lisa. And one stock that's weighing is General Mills. Shares are heading toward the worst day since January. This after they put up a mixed quarter, but it's more the outlook, the adjusted earnings outlook for the year, not great. And finally, it seems that consumers out there are not willing to pay higher prices for their uh, favorite products. Uh, again, this stock having its worst day for since January. But it's not just General Mills that's down. As we talked about before, we have the shares of NVIDIA dropping. The last time I looked by about 3% or so on on the day, this, of course, is the U.S. Uh, there's a report saying that the U.S. may potentially put curbs on sales of AI-related chips to China. We also have the shares of Freeport MacMoran down in sympathy with copper. And then ahead of those uh, stress tests, those Fed stress test bank results later today, Lisa, we do have shares of big banks at this point basically unchanged on the day, maybe a little bit to the downside. Abigail, thank you so much. Investors, meanwhile, keeping a close watch on the developments out of Sintra. Fed Chair Jay Powell joining the world's top central bankers in Portugal for a panel on monetary policy. Not there quite yet with an empty podium. But joining us now on what to expect when someone does take the helm of that podium is Bloomberg's Michael McKee. Mike, what are we looking for today? 
Well, I think what you'll see is the three major Western central bankers reinforcing the message that they've put out over the last couple of weeks that they're not done raising rates and that when rates go up, they're going to stay there for a while. The interesting wild card and the thing that I would find most interesting out of this is what the Japanese say, Kazuo Ueda, new uh, central banker in Japan, with a currency that is just sort of diving off a cliff because of interest rate differentials at this point. And if those three are talking about raising rates and widening that differential, then what's going to happen to the yen? Now, this is not, Lisa, necessarily a uh, forum where anybody's going to go out on a limb. And so I don't expect any major announcements or major moves, but you may see the Japanese try to jawbone a little bit. They've been doing that behind the scenes in Tokyo. And we may see the others uh, doing their best to indicate that uh, it doesn't matter what happens in other economies. They've got an inflation problem, as you can see, uh, and they're going to take care of that first and foremost. There's a real distinction being drawn between the different central banks, Mike, and we're expecting to hear that contrast on the stage today. How will the tone of ECB President Christine Lagarde differ from that of Fed President Jay Powell? Well, it's a matter of degree. The ECB is behind the U.S. in terms of its overall tightening, and they are still looking at an inflation rate that is stronger uh, overall for the Eurozone than in the United States. Powell is in a position where they think they're pretty close to being at a tight enough level uh, that they could sometime soon stop. The problem for all of these people is they don't want markets to start pricing in rate cuts and loosening financial conditions. So the emphasis is going to be on the idea of continually raising rates and leaving open the possibility that getting past July, we could see additional rate cut uh, rate increases because that will keep the markets on their toes. Interesting thing, when you look at the uh, WIRP function on the Bloomberg, and I don't know if you noticed it today, Lisa, but they have modified it. We now go yes. out another year <laughs> in terms of futures pricing. But basically what we're looking at is a uh, rate increase in July or for the Bank of England, August 3rd, uh, for those three, and uh, then nothing for the Japanese. Uh, there's a 50 basis point move uh, priced in right now for the Bank of England, uh, the U.S. and the Europeans 25 basis points. So uh, they want to keep that, the markets focus on that. Yeah, and that's definitely uh, going to be a tension on the stage with Kazuo Ueda coming in. If he's talking about monetary theory, Mike, how awkward will it be for him at a time when they're moving the, in the exact opposite direction of everybody else and trying to juice inflation that's expected to keep increasing in that nation? Well, everybody knows the situation they're in and what they're trying to accomplish. What will interest markets more, and I don't know if they'll get into this, is what happens when they decide that the inflation rate is stable enough at a high enough level. How do they get out of the extraordinary policy that they have adopted? I've talked to people in Tokyo and with the uh, Bank of Japan who worry that uh, they're going to have an issue with rates rising very rapidly, won't necessarily hurt consumers and businesses as much as it could hurt the government because the government owns so many JGBs that debt service could become a real problem. So that's going to be the question when they start raising rates or start to even get out of the raising rates uh, or the, the low rate regime and markets front run them. What happens to interest rates then? That would be a, a really good question to ask of him. One thing that uh, we're looking at when we turn back to the U.S. is that the economic data has been coming in strong and at the strongest or the most uh, frequent upside surprises versus the downside ones relative to expectations going back to February of 2021. This comes at a time when there are signs that the housing market is stabilized and started to rebound. Does this present a problem for Jay Powell? Well, it's a problem if it means that companies continue to raise prices because demand is stronger than supply. Uh, that's an open question at this point. We did see uh, inventories rise a little bit on the retail side, uh, and the way inventories have been going, um, that's adding to GDP, but we don't know whether it's because companies think that demand is strong or whether it's an accident. They have overbuilt the uh, stocks. So uh, that's going to be a, an interesting question going forward. Uh, the other uh, side of that question is now that we're building so much capacity uh, in terms of chip plants and things 
things like that, that's all going to feed into GDP and keep the economy strong. But it won't necessarily be inflationary unless we run short of building materials. So for the Fed, it's going to be a supply and demand question going forward. And that'll be kind of the, the bottom line question for the idea of whether there's a soft landing or not. Michael McKee, uh, stick by uh, while we wait for this panel to begin. Coming up, that panel with Fed uh, Chair Jay Powell joining the other central bank heads will be uh, coming up shortly in Sintra, Portugal, and we will take you there. That's up next. This is Bloomberg.